Attention, culture consumers. Join me, the queen of queries, Sarah O'Connor, and my band of nerdy knights. Colleen McMillan. Flo Siegel. And Anders Drew. On Bohemian Geek Studies, where we take extremely dorky dives into our favorite fandoms, especially that Star Wars galaxy far, far away. Listen each week as we examine the stories that mean so much to us. Bohemian Geek Studies is available wherever you get your podcasts and is proudly part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Hi, I'm Mike. And I'm Dave. And join us every Thursday for a new episode of Two Player Bros, a podcast about two guys who play way too many video games. Join me and Dave as we talk about the latest in Xbox, PlayStation, PC, and VR news, previews, and reviews. We have it all, and we play it all. And join us every other week for Post Game, where we play through and dive deep into our favorite modern classics and new releases. That's Two Player Bros, available every Thursday wherever you get your podcast. part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that exits are conveniently located at the front and rear of this auditorium. When leaving the theater, we suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. No, you're gross. You know you're gross. I don't see, I don't... Oh, whoa, whoa, that's not what we do here on FC. <laughs> <laughs> adjusting himself in his car with the lights on. He doesn't yeah. even turn the light off in his car. Uh, Gremlins Don't too. look it up. Don't look it up. <laughs> ah, dads. Gotta love him. What have I done? What have I done? Hi, I'm Mike Butler. And I'm Mike Field. And you are listening to the Forgotten Cinema Podcast. Each episode, we highlight a film that for a variety of reasons was forgotten by audiences. Whether it be because a more popular movie was released at the same time or the film simply didn't catch on with audiences in its initial run. We'll discuss what we love about the movie or maybe don't love about it, but we always recommend you revisit it because you never know. You might find your own forgotten gem. If you enjoy our podcast, please feel free to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you are listening to this podcast. Nice. 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 Woo! <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing great. I just watched a really uh, funny comedy uh, for this week's movie. What is it? What you watch? Uh, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. It was hilarious. A, it was a riot. <laughs> hilarious. Such an upbeat movie. <laughs> <laughs> so we are doing Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, as Mike said, from 2011. Give you a quick synopsis, and then we will get into the facts. In 1970s England, the head of MI6 Control dispatches an agent to meet with a Hungarian general who knows the identity of a Soviet spy in the organization's ranks. However. The mission goes wrong, and the general dies before he can reveal the information. Undersecretary Oliver Lakin? Is that right? Oliver Lakin calls Lakin's veteran right, agent yeah. George Smiley back from forced retirement to ferret out the mole and stop the flow of vital British secrets to the Russians. Excellent. Did you ever read this book? I always wanted to, but I have not read this book. So this book is from 1974 from John LeCare. I think I probably said that wrong. Did I I think that he's a huge right. author. Yeah. I think he actually recently passed away. Is that not? Is that right? I think he passed away this year. This year? Or, la or, or, or last 2020, year? Twenty twenty. Yeah, I think so. Yes, what? he did. It was uh, December twelfth. So wow, that's actually really recent. Yeah. All right. So um, I, let's get you into the facts of the movie, not just the book. Do uh, it. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy has a runtime of one hundred and twenty-two minutes. It's rated R. Production budget of $21 million, which that surprised me. I thought this would be a much higher production budget. Mm. Now, it has two release dates. It's limited release, which is the 9th of December in 2011. And then it's limited, excuse me, then it's wide release on January 6, 2012. And that's clearly because they wanted to get it out before the Oscars. Uh, so I'm going to actually, we're going to go through the limited release in terms of what movies came out around that time. But I do have some wide release uh, information as well, Butler. Opening weekend, that's why I'm prefacing this because it's opening weekend for limited release did $310,000, which probably means that it was like in two theaters or three theaters, something like that. Probably, yeah, two theaters yeah. in LA or something. Uh, domestic, uh, it did $24 million and worldwide $81 million, which makes sense that it was uh, a big hit in uh, England, which I believe it was the highest grossing film at the UK box office for three straight weeks. Uh, this actually- It's this, got all their actors in it, so no wonder. Oh, no <laughs> oh, no doubt. It actually won the BAFTA for best film, and it has three Oscar nods for best adapted screenplay, best original score, and best uh, leading actor, which was Gary Oldman. Uh, he did not win, but he, went, he goes on to win uh, next year, or the year, a couple of years later, 
for the darkest hour was that that was a while ago that was 2017 i think yeah darkest hour yeah, was re- that was more recent later, yeah. i apologize i apologize it was more recent okay so we have a bunch of production companies studio canal carla films uh paradise films kino welt film productions which are i believe that's a german film production and working title films it has several distributors studio canal distributed in france and the uk uh, Kino Welt Vilmerville, I said that completely wrong, released in Germany, and then Focus Features released it here in the U.S. So on the 9th of December, its limited release, it went up against some wide releases of New Year's Eve. That was not good. The Sitter, <laughs> uh, which is basically Adventures of Babysitting, uh, tr- trying to be Adventures of Babysitting. And The Descendants, uh, that's the George Clooney, Alexander Payne uh, directed movie. In the limited release, you also had Young Adult uh, that same week. The week. Uh- what does that sound familiar? Young adult? Yeah. Well, that's your favorite screenwriter, Diablo Cody. I oh, believe. that's right. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> December 16th, which was a uh, the week after you had Alvin and the Chipmunks Chipwrecked, Sherlock Holmes, A Game of Shadows, and in a limited release, you had Mission Impossible, Ghost Protocol. I think limited because I think that was when, did it come out in IMAX? Ghost Protocol? Or was that Rogue Nation I'm thinking about that came out in IMAX like a week before it came out in the theaters? Like in terms of that, that might, might have like been Rogue Ghost, Nation. The, Ghost Protocol is when he's in the prison. So it might have been Rogue Nation. It, it might have been Rogue Nation. Yeah. No, nah, one of them had their opening was attached to a different film to like advertise the film. And then one of them opened early, but I don't remember which one. I think which. Rogue Nation opened early because okay. it's the most recent one. So that's the 16th. This movie came out on the 9th, which means it went through the holiday season. I'm going to give you the holiday movies as well. So the 21st, you had Adventures of Tintin which I really like the girl with the dragon tattoo, the David Fincher one. And then ghost protocol was in a wide release. And then on the 23rd, you had, we bought a zoo, the Matt Damon star. And then on Christmas, the 25th, you had war horse. The, this is what the darkest hour. So it was that same year. Why do I feel like darkest hour was like, Oh, you know what? This no, you know what? This is the darkest hour. That's oh, the weird monsters in Russia. The one in Russian. Yeah. Yeah. Which, why is that a, a Christmas release is beyond me. And then extremely loud and incredibly close. That is the uh, movie about uh, 9-11. A lot of good movies around that the week. I'm not saying The Darkest Hour was a good movie. No, it's okay. The other, the other movies were. Well, War Horse is a big movie. It's Spielberg's film. We bo- I actually like We Bought a Zoo, Cameron Crowe's yeah. movie. And Fincher's Tattoo. No, that's actually, yeah, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Uh, so in its wide release, not a lot of stuff going after it in the wide release. It released up against The Devil Inside. And the week after you have that, this is the sixth. And the week after, which is the 13th of January, Contraband, Joyful Noise, and The Iron Lady in a wide release. And a limited release of The Iron Lady was the week before. That is the Mel Mel Streep won the Oscar for her portrayal of Margaret Thatcher in that. Okay. Right. But if you watch The Crown, um, Gillian Anderson's Margaret Thatcher is much, much better. Much, much. I feel like you might be biased. But that's also Uh, possible. No, no. It is is much better. Trust me. They're both great performances, but Anderson's is really good. Okay. I believe you. Shut up. So <laughs> I was on your eyes like, I don't not believe it. This this movie is directed by Thomas Alfredson. Uh, he is a German director who did Let the Right One In, the original Let the Right One In. Yeah. He also did The Snowman, which is probably why he hasn't done anything since. I heard that was not a good movie. Uh, written by Bridget O'Connor and Peter Schraugen. I think I got that right. Now, this movie is dedicated to Bridget O'Connor because she passed away before it came out, uh, which is pretty sad. She had written 66. Mrs. Ratcliffe's Revolution and, and the Straugen had done the debt, Frank and the Goldfinch. He also has, he was a writing partner of uh, Miss O'Connor as well. So he did those uh, movies, but most of her films as well. Mm. Cinematography by Hoyt Van Hoytnema. I'm probably screwing that name up. He was nominated for an Oscar for Dunkirk. He also did Tenant at Astra and Spectre, Mike. He did Spectre. Okay. Comp- I don't like Spectre. I know, but I like bringing up the James Bond I mean, movies. his cinematography is okay though, but yeah. But you don't like Spectre. Uh, at all have you ever seen it since then uh yeah i own it all right i've watched it i've watched it two or three times i still don't like it composer was alberto iglesias he is was nominated for an oscar for the kite runner and the constant gardener he also did all about my mother the editor is dino jonaster yeah that's how i would say it he did (laughs) he did the professor and the madman the let the right one in again and then he's done the tv show big little lies Produced by Tim Bevan, Eric Fellner, and Robin Slovo. Bevan has done Rebecca, the, the remake, Drop Dead Fred and Dead Man Walking. Fellner did the that Fellner did the Darkest Hour that Old Men's in. <laughs> uh, he also did Theory of Everything and Frost and Nixon. Uh, he that's those all three of the were nominated for Best Picture. He is a producer on six total Best Picture nomination nominated wow. films. Slovo has done the McMafia TV series, the movie The Statement, and The Two Faces of January, which I believe is most recent. So Mike told you there's a lot of people in this movie. There are. You had Gary Oldman as George Smiley. He was in, he won an Oscar for The Darkest Hour, the uh, 
the um, Winston Churchill Darkest Hour. He also is in the Dark Knight trilogy. He plays Chief Gordon, and he's in more recently Mank, which he'll probably get nominated for soon. Um, when does this come out? February? This episode? This episode will come out in uh, no. This episode will come out in March, I believe. So either he has already been nominated, or he already has won. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Strong as Jim Prado. He is in the Kingsman, the first two Kingsmen. He's also in Shazam and 1917, amongst others. John Hurt, who passed away about four years ago in 2017, he plays Control. He is from 1984. You've probably seen him in Alien. He is nominated for two Oscars, one for The Elephant Man and the other for Midnight Express. Toby Jones as Percy Alaline. I'm going to guess most people know him as the bad guy from Captain America 1 and 2. He's also in The Hunger Games and Infamous. He plays Truman Capote in that. David Densick as Toby Esterhaus. He's from the TV show Chernobyl, which is awesome. He's also in Warhorse and Regression. Syrian Hines as Roy Bland. He's from Munich, which I love. He's in the TV show The Terror, the first one not the second one i think the second one is like a it's an anthology series the first one's when they're on the boat uh, he's also in circle of friends and just he's i have justice league here because he's the voice of steppenwolf yes yeah. yes colin firth as bill hayden he won an oscar for the king's speech he was also nominated for an oscar for a single man he's in 1917 and mary poppins returns benedict gumberpatch as peter gilliam he is from the tv show sherlock he's also dr strange he has also been nominated for an oscar for the imitation game Tom Hardy as Ricky Tarr, uh, Ricky with an I. He is in <laughs> he's in Venom. He's also uh, in Mad Max Fury Road, and he was nominated for an Oscar for the movie The Revenant. And then Kathy Burke as Connie Sachs. Uh, she's in Elizabeth, Sid and Nancy, and School of Roars, the TV show, which I believe is a BBC show. Well, Tom Hardy was also uh, Go for cloned it. Patrick Stewart in Star Trek uh, Nemesis. <laughs> I think I didn't we have that conversation once. I think we we might have. Yeah. How about how that turned him to drugs? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's what you said to me. That he. Yeah. Life. Yeah. That's what you had said. That's unfortunate. This is uh, this is actually Alfredson's uh, the director's first English film. I don't know if you knew that. I did not know that. And one other note I had about you know the writing was that originally Peter Morgan wrote a draft of the screenplay. He has written the Queen and the Last King of Scotland. But he had to back out because of a death in the family. So he's not on the main credits, but he did do a draft of this screenplay. Hmm. So, Butler. Yes. I don't know where you want to start. Uh, first of all, I want to commend you. Why? Because we had like a crap ton of actors in this film. And you did it very well and very quick. Hey, thanks, man. No problem. I'm trying. I was like, oh, man, this is going to take 30 minutes. <laughs> There's so many actors. <laughs> <laughs> or then this guy's in it. And then that guy's um, in it. Or maybe we should start from, I think, the... I mean, the first thing I noticed at the start of this movie, because now now I'm watching this, you know, to talk about it, is the opening sequence gave me really big Condor vibes, like big time uh, in terms of the way it's shot, the music, the colorizing of the the film, obviously the setting, because it's, you know, the 60s, 70s. It's a very ever. bleached out, desaturated, plain brown look. Right. Yes. Reminds me of movies like French Connection or The Conversation or uh, Condor. It just really, really reminds me of that kind of style of film. And the look and also, I guess, the thematic element of the film, that kind of hopelessness, I guess, that dreariness that's in those films, I think, really kind of was what they were going for in this. And I really noticed that. And I really appreciated that because you don't see movies like that anymore. That are right. Made. Well, it's a very turbulent time. But it's also it seems not just in, in terms of the decade or the time period that the movie's set in, but also in terms of the characters. You have you start off where Smiley and Control are pushed out. Like it's you don't know how to feel because every time you look at Smiley, you don't really know what he's thinking, but you get this idea that he's depressed at some uh, and and you kind of figure out maybe why he's a little down or he's just hiding his feelings. He's keeping a, a, an even keel, right? But I think that reflects the look of the film as well uh, in terms of. I just saying like, it's just very, it's very dreary. I thought, especially when they're in Hungary and it's raining and he goes there and that whole opening scene. Right. It's always, I don't think there's like a sunny day in the entire movie. Yeah. Maybe the end when he, well, maybe the very end of the movie. I will say that there's two things that jumped out at me when I was kind of going through the movie. One is that I, I had a very tough time with the time element in the beginning. I had a very tough time catching up to what was the past and what was the present. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Be, I, it was just because everything was happening. It just was happening. And I was really like thrown off. I go, OK, wait a minute. When did that happen? When did this happen? And then and then I realized that the key was his glasses, was that when he goes to get his glasses, he gets new eyeglasses. Mm -hmm. And 
every time you went back, he had the old glasses on. So then I realized, okay, now I know where we are in this time element and yeah. where we are in the movie. But in the beginning, it threw me off a bit. The time, like just, just went what was in the past and what was in the present. Yeah, I had that same kind of thought. The movie does cut around without really telling you or without like any kind of warning. Uh, the glasses are an element. I was wondering how long it was between him getting forced retirement and coming back. And then you find out like three quarters of the way through the film, it's been a year. There are also moments where Tom Hardy's telling him or Ricky's telling his story and they go from, you know, one thing to another thing, him with Irina. And you're like, is that a day? Is that two days? Is that a week? Yeah. And it just cuts. It just, it goes, you just kind of have to, you're piecing together the story as much as you get as much information, I think, as Oldman gets for the most part. Although well, he does also hide some stuff from you. If Oldman, if if Smiley has been down for a year in terms of not working for a year and this, all the stuff with the control and Jim Perdue going over there to have that meeting, which is Mark Strong's character, that happens bef- that happens, and then they push Control out and he takes Smiley with him. Right. Control gets pushed out because it was an unsanctioned operation. But, like the, but the Ricky Tarr stuff was is probably even before all that. So for the whole year, Ricky oh, Tarr yeah. has been on the run. Oh, wow. I didn't even realize because, that. Because they, because they had Jim Perdue. And Irina in the same room. Yes. She was already captured. Yes. Yeah. I didn't even think of that. Right. The other thing, because I know I said two points before. The other thing that's jumped out at me, not as in terms of this movie on a whole, not just the time difference and when when the past and when the present was, was I think this movie, I don't think people are going to really relate to this movie unless they really love spy movies. Because this movie is so steeped in the spy genre that if you are not into it, I think people would get really bored. You know, do you, do you oh, know what I'm saying? I yeah. absolutely agree. That's why I really love this movie because I'm really into spy stuff. Uh, but which I kind of told you last episode, like you really love like mysteries and noirs, and that's all your whole thing. My whole thing has always been more spy stuff, right? Like that's kind of my genre. There's no like big action set pieces. It is really like this is look at this. this is oh, of course. Information. This is how they double cross. Right. Sending these coded messages to each other and the double cross and like right. the different sections within the spy organization and stuff like that. That's really boring to somebody who's not really <laughs> into it or someone who doesn't really like history as well because it is very set in its kind of time period i think yeah i mean you i mean it would it would be beneficial if you knew of the relationship between nations back then or or the cold war wink wink relationship between spies Right. You know like what I mean? Soviets and the spot. Just like, doing a job, but you know that they're there being followed. You know that somebody's telling you that that whole kind of thing. I th- that that would help. That helps to know that. Right. I don't mind spy. I like spy genre and I like spy films. And I don't mind movies that give you more questions than answers. I don't need all the answers in the movies. Maybe mm-hmm. just for the main story and the main plot or terms right. of our, whatever character we're following. Like even like three days of the condor does that they do kind of wrap up that little story, but there's still tons of questions and still tons of ways that could go after that. Right. I just, I think sometimes in spies, it's spy genres. It's evident. A really good one is confident in the way they're telling the story. So they know they, they're okay. They're comfortable giving you questions. Like they're the questions that they're giving you, they know that those are not as important as the questions that need, they need to answer for the story in and of itself. Some spy genres fail when they're just like oh and then we'll give them these red herrings and then we'll give them oh it could be this or it could be this and we'll just confuse people and it's and then you get to the, when they reveal the reveal it's it's kinda, so underwhelming it's very heist movie-esque yeah of, of the twists yeah it's just twist after twist so yeah which this movie really isn't this movie really is focused on we got to find the mole by just finding out who the mole is and dripping clues to you mm-hmm. which i think is really interesting Although there are other, obviously, it's not just about the mole. There's other subplots and storylines that go through it. Did you find the Ricky Tar subplot just shows up and kind of throws the movie off kilter a little bit? I know it's kind of connected, but it really isn't. It's out of nowhere. I would like it a little bit more toward the beginning of the film to give it a little bit more of a connection. But I like that it kind of shows or a lot of these guys are the higher ups, the high echelon of spies. These are guys that were doing it in the 40s and 50s, you know, during the war and the beginning of the Cold War. You know, Ricky shows the boots on the ground guys. This is, and, and in some way also Peter, but he's more of the at the home office guy. But 
Yeah, I didn't get. We can get to Peter a little bit, but go ahead with your with your point. Uh, Peter's kind of like dude money, Benny. I think like he's <laughs> he's in the office and he's connected, but he's not quite. But I don't know what he does. I except, think he's except like, push papers. I think he's the money penny guy. Yeah, he pushes the papers and makes sure that they can just do whatever they need to do. Okay. So he's got high access, but he's not really one of them. Uh, but Ricky, because he's boots on the ground, you see what it's like when there's no clear. And and it's kind of said when George goes to visit the other woman who used to work there. Oh, the one that remember. tells him. Yeah. Uh, like Connie she's, Sachs. When Connie, obviously, she has got one of the best lines in the uh, <laughs> the movie. I believe that's, I don't know if it's in the book mm -hmm. but it's something that someone said to the author oh really and yeah so i don't know if it's in the book but it has to be in the book then it's a great line yeah you know i don't know about you george but i feel thoroughly underfucked <laughs> yeah the two, two yeah kids uh, i was trying to figure room. out where was she was she in a halfway house i think she was at her house i think those were either her kids or her grandkids and she's watching them just i think that's why the kids just went you know my grandma's watching we gotta we should get out of here <laughs> i thought she wanted I, my note there was like she wants some george Oh, she definitely wants me, George. Uh, <laughs> Connie mentions it that, you know, a real war, Englishmen could be proud then. Yes. Because it's so much more difficult in the Cold War. It's like, who's the bad guy? Who's the good guy? What are we doing this for? Well, it, yeah. And that's the, a big thing in spy genres course. in the Cold War is, is what's the point? And that's why I think a lot of the Soviet spy, you know, Western spies are frenemies most of, so half the time in movies where... You know, they know each other spying on them. They send each other bottles of wine or whatever, a wink and a nod. And yeah. Stuff. Uh, it's very difficult, especially after uh, the World War II and up even even now. It's very difficult to really have a great big bad guy or a great big bad entity anymore because it's always, it's always muddy. It's always, it was, you know what I mean? It's always muddled in terms of uh, right. a, 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 somebody who is you perceive as being bad, their motivation in terms of, you know, I'm not excusing anything. I'm just saying that it's it's not as clear cut as it was probably the last time was World War II. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I think Ricky Tar kind of shows that boots on the ground fighting for this purpose that he has no idea what it is. But yet he's seeing people die around him. He's getting tortured is, you know, he's watching this girl get shipped off and beat up and tortured. And yeah, that's what he's there. To, I think he's there to show that that personal connection because i think a lot of the upper echelon guys like george all the bad guys all all the quote-unquote bad guys that worked with control originally oh that, line yeah, hayden all yeah. those bland even though george bland doesn't do anything in this he, oh, i was gonna get just, to that yeah go ahead i don't think he has a line <laughs> he, he's like the least syrian hines is in this and i like syrian hines quite a bit he's awesome in munich and if you haven't seen munich i'm i'm highly recommending you see it not you but people are listening right. uh but he does nothing. There's nothing for him to do in this movie. He doesn't. I really don't think he had a line. Does he have a line? He does. He talks every once in a while, but it's. Or he says something to Peter when he's on the elevator. There's, it's like, yeah. oh, it's okay, yeah, Peter, or something yeah. like that. And he walks yeah, out. he will care to have lunch. And so I'm going to have lunch. Do you want a company? That guy that was it. Like, I wonder if he has a, a bigger scene. I wonder if he had more to do in terms of the Russian connection. Well, maybe he's a big character in the book. Yeah. But yeah, he didn't have much to do here. Yeah. But they're all upper echelon guys. They're already emotionless. They're already kind of cut off from. From the world they're already at a different level of especially george of that's why george is so emotionless i think a he's depressed but b he's just like he knows not to give anything away and i think he learned that after he talked to carla where he talks about how you know he went too much into the wife thing and i thought that was great i thought that was a great scene it's a great he, model yeah, he basically reveals and if, if you take it further the whole genesis of the turn of of how the mole was able to infiltrate uh you know the circus as they call it right uh because he he, he says he's trying carla, to flip yeah. carla and he says to peter that he he revealed more about himself than he did about carla revealing how much his wife was important to him right he steals his lighter gives and and then he presumed he was going to go die but he didn't die and and now that leads to the mole which is spoiler alert is hayden basically hayden goes with his wife Cheats, steals, not steals, but sleeps with, uh, George's, sleeps with wife. George's wife because Carla said to him, he's got a soft spot. His wife, he won't even see it coming. So if you're hiding anything, that's what he'll see. That what that's what it'll be. Right. He won't suspect you for being a mole. So I just thought they, like, and that's all from that conversation many, many years ago. And I'm like, I liked the story mm -hmm. of him telling Peter, but I almost wondered if we should have seen that. They never show Carla. I like that we never see Yeah, that. but I wondered if, like, would you have wanted, like, the movie to start off with that scene? 
only if because I really like the way he and I, I kind of made fun of it before we were recording about how he just kind of just gets into reenacting the scene. But only if he was able to reenact it perfectly to Peter, I would want to watch him still want to watch that reenactment. And I would oh, want they, it to be a perfect reenactment of the, the other thing. scene. Yeah, that was that was that scene is really well shot. Because he turns and then the camera instantly becomes his POV. It almost does that in camera for you. Right. Changes where he is, even though it never leaves the location. But it almost, the way the camera shoots George in that moment. It's now a new scene. Addresses it. Yeah, almost kind of like pulls you there where you can envision it, it happening. It was like you were watching a stage play all of a sudden, which was really cool. Like, yeah. You know, like the no. lights like dimmed down and a spotlight shone on him and he was able to, you know, yeah, ham it up. No, there's not he's hamming it up, but really like show his chops. I mean, I know we talked about I joked a little bit when I was in was saying who directed it was Alfredson, you know, the snowman. And that's why he hasn't gotten a thing, you know, but that's a that's a joke. But, you know, your movie, not all movies are great, but this movie was good enough where he, I'm surprised he doesn't have more credits. Even yeah. though I I'm a big fan of the original Let the Right One In. I didn't understand why they did the remake. Which and was almost exactly like exactly. I mean, everyone loves the what is let me in, right? Let me in. Everyone yeah. loves the remake, and yeah, it's great. But it's basically almost seventy five percent shot for shot of the original. People like it because Chloe Moretz did do a really good job. Sure, and it didn't have subtitles. But it doesn't. The but ending is not, different, right? The ending is less ambiguous. The original. Well, so I'm talking and about. It's a lighter ending too, isn't in it? In the original, in let the right one in the original, they have the whole pool scene. Which I love. Oh, the full scene's awesome. But they don't do that in the in the in the remake, right? It's different. Yeah. So that's see, that's the thing. Like the original is so much better. It's just I'm sorry, but like when a movie, when a foreign film is so much good, is so good. Yeah. There's no reason to remake it. Just highlight it. But anyways, then I'll I'll get off my soapbox. Yeah. Well, also this is a guy that's filming this movie in England. He's not home. True. Maybe he just wants to do more stuff, you know, back home. But my point is that this movie is very well directed. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This yes. movie has a. Uh, I always talk about confidence in storytelling and confidence in the direction, and that always shines through. And this movie, it shines through immensely. Oh yeah. Yeah. It takes a great director to make a movie like this, where, to be honest, it's kind of boring. True. And make it really interesting and. And something that really makes you want to watch it. Well, you also have you also have to convince a lot of these actors to buy in to the vision and to Oldman's credit. And I didn't write down all the comments and the quotes, but he does talk about how like he there's a he has one of the he's the one that brought up the comment where. Uh, Alfredson used long lenses during the production to create that like voyeuristic look mm -hmm. of the movie. Like you're kind of like a spy movie. And like Oldman right. says, oh, that's one, that's Oldman's comment. And he was like, and it's really a, a great choice. And so I think you have to have buy-in on your actors. And I think they were, Alfredson was able to do that and get these guys all like, okay, let's, let's roll. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, well, all these guys decided to do this movie and they're all fantastic actors. And some of them have very small parts. I mean, even Hayden who ends up being, you know, the mole, the bad guy is a really, is not a very big part. He's not a very large part of this movie. And he's in this movie. Mark Strong has maybe 15 total minutes. I mean, it's, it's really just, yes, I want to be in this movie because this is going to be a good movie. Oh, no, I, no doubt. This oh. movie, this person, this person's in it. Hey, let's talk about Hayden and Perdo. Okay. Uh, Mark Strong and, and Colin Firth's character. Are we supposed to ins uh, assume that they had a sexual relationship? That's what I inferred the first time I saw it, and that's what I'm inferring this time I'm yeah. watching it. But it could just be that they're brothers almost in arms. They're, I'm not they're sure. Really friends. Yeah. But yeah, maybe maybe they were doing it. Maybe Hayden is uh, homosexual, and he's only you know banging George's wife to right persuade, persuade him. But yeah, maybe he is. I mean, you know. it would be we probably would have a better understanding if we both read the book and kind of know where they're coming. But to that point, the Peter character that Benedict Cumberbatch plays. In the movie, Smiley tells him, get your affairs in order because they're probably watching you. And he goes home, he breaks up with his boyfriend. So you find out that he's gay. He has a, right. he has a boy. And obviously in the 70s, that's, you know, that's going to be a big thing. It's going to be a problem. And he's he's upset because he's breaking up with him. But that's not in the book. In the book, he's not gay. So they made that character gay, I guess, just for that showing that the sacrifice that he made would, right. would have to make, which, which is fine. But I'm wondering if, you know, if the hayden Prado relationship was maybe not. Um, just, I mean, it could be some deep, deep friendship, love and desire. Um, uh, cause even at the end he sees him when Perdo shows up to shoot him, mm -hmm. he sees him. Oh and, yeah. And he knows that it's almost like he's about to say something or he's about to acknowledge it. And then he just gets shot in the cheek. I think he's about to nod like, yeah, you can shoot me. Yeah. He, uh, Perdo doesn't even give him that 
yeah that chance to yeah we're done i didn't i didn't really grasp fully the relationship or well maybe i i know why it's in there maybe but i didn't know if we needed it where he becomes the teacher and he's with and he, he befriends that boy the speckled boy the bespeckled boy uh, i think it's just to show that there's a kindness in him you don't think it's you don't think it's because they're trying to show that he's trying to engage or or enter the world into the civilian oh, world for sure that too but he can't yeah and maybe i mean in the book i'm sure they go into like his head and be like oh that kid is was me when i was a child let me try to he come under my wings so he doesn't become me mm-hmm. and then he kicks the kid out obviously and shows that he's done trying to be a person well do you think he would come back to the circus not he probably uh, can't be an agent because he's blown I don't know because he did give up the information regardless of yes, he was going to give up the information regardless. I mean, no one can withstand that amount of torture for forever, which he even says, but it is a betrayal for enough time. It is a betrayal that Hayden gave him up. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, But I don't think he'd be let back in. I think regardless, no one understands the torture unless they've been through the torture. So they'd be like, no, you gave us up. You should have withstood it that whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, you can't. When, and he didn't give it up. He didn't hold uh, hold on enough to let the uh, rest of that station out. Right, right. Which apparently they just didn't even care anyway. It's not like they were like worried. One of the lines I really liked in this movie, uh, and I think it it actually really uh, resonates in terms of the current climate, is it was when he tells Peter, I think it's in that same speech that we talked about. I'm not sure, though. He tells him a fanatic is always hiding a secret doubt. Oh, yep. That's I, that lo- same I love that line. I, I, th- I, I wrote that one. Yeah, too. Yeah, that line is just like, yep. Like somebody who is so fanatical about something is really secretly doubtful about that same thing. So, so no, no, yeah, no. Yeah. And it's it's so I think that is very not just in today's current climate, but throughout history, I think. And, and, and even if you kind of take that comment to its base form in terms of, so, you know, he doth protest too much like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like even in its base base form in terms of your relationship with other people, it makes complete, complete sense. That's such a great line. And whether that's from the book or just from the screenplay, you know, I, I just wanted to highlight that. I thought it was really good. If you love something, you, you love it flaws and all. And if you right. can't see the flaw in something, then you're not really in love with something. Right. 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 And I also love the line when smiley goes to see Hayden after it's revealed that he's the mole. And they're in the room together and mm-hmm. he says, you know, I, 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 I suspected it or I, I, something like, oh, somebody should have suspected or whatever. Right. And, and Hayden says to him, so did you, but it's like, it's almost like a double meaning. It's not just you, you suspected me cheating with your wife, but you also suspected me being the mole. Like it was, like it meant both. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? I like that line as well. There's a lot of really nice, like you said, dialogue moments you know, which is unfortunate because we started off talking about how if you're not into spy genre movies, you won't be into this movie. But it's unfortunate because you're missing out on a lot of really nice scenes and well, moments. The dialogue is also another thing that's very like 70s. It's very under underdone, I guess. They're not like telling you the story like out like really like hammering it. Like you got to listen. Mm-hmm. The The story is in the dialogue, but they're talking like regular people or they're also spies so they're also always hiding something in the way they talk or or not letting you know everything because they're not letting the people they're talking to know everything right and if you're talking to somebody in real life especially if you have a secret you're not just going to blab it out for the camera because there's no cameras around you Mm -hmm. and that is what this is this is a very you need to watch and understand the story to understand the dialogue yeah i I, you you've been in conversations with people where they're just waiting for you to stop talking so that they can talk like, you know, like they're like not really, podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. Uh, so, but you know what I'm saying? Right. That, yeah. That's like, this movie is the antithesis of that. This movie is, takes its time. It's, it's setting it up. It's telling you the story and it's not, it's, it's just, it's, it's laying it out for you, but it's, it's not just getting everything out. So you, you won't cut it off. You know what I mean? Yep. It's almost like this story is like, this movie is, this is the story and we're taking your time. And if you're going to walk out of the theater, or you're going to turn it off. That's your problem because you're going to miss out on something good. You know what I mean? Like it's almost like that. Yeah. And I think that's, that's very rare these days. I, I, there are those movies are out there now. Those type of films are out there, 
but it's very rare and not as, not as much as it used to be. Yeah. Now it's all about boom, 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 boom. Like you just kind of like, and he, we need to get your attention. We need to keep going. We need to keep going. 90 minutes is up. See you later. Like, you know, like that kind of <laughs> thing. So, but so I, that's another reason why I probably appreciate this movie a little bit more than most. Yeah. I mean, you also like, <laughs> you also like those 1970s type. I do love well, which films. Again, this because is, they do that. Yeah. yeah. Because it's, it's, it's story over it's, substance over style i love style don't get me wrong i love style <laughs> i love action films i love when action films are awesome i love mission impossible i love all those type of movies when you have a really cool action then you walk back in the theater to watch again like those are great right but sometimes you want a movie like this yeah but i would probably yeah these type of movies are the movies that stay with you longer right you know what i mean but those movies that i reference in terms of the action movies good action films that have both style and substance are great there's not a lot of Movies that are not a lot of action films that like that. Like uh, there's movies like Fast and Furious franchise, which is like going on number nine. There, there are go. moments throughout that series that like, OK, that's cool. Action. See, Fast Five's got some cool action stuff. There's but I'm never going to go back. and be like, Ooh, that's on. Let's watch like, you know, because it's not something that stays with me. You know, you know, so like something like a Mission Impossible, a uh, Ghost Protocol, a Rogue Nation, like the Ghost Protocol opening in Mission Impossible is fantastic. Yeah. With, you know, with the prison scene. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that sucks you in. Rogue Nation's got some good stuff too. The whole scene in Paris when he's getting chased and he's on the bike and when they're trying to like, you know, the break, that whole scene is great too. So there's, there's action beats in those movies that are really good, but there's a lot more substance in those films as well. I don't know why I'm, I don't know why we got into that topic. But <laughs> what did you think of Densick crying? when they when they got him at the plane on the uh, airstrip i thought it was very much what his character would do what a lot but of he's like supposed to be like do. a major spy no he's supposed to be just the head of the spy organization he's just the guy who knows things he was never i, I never got the image like him or uh percy Oh, I'm sorry. I pick it back. Densick is the actor's name. Esther That's House. Okay. Esther House. Yeah. I was thinking. I was just like, uh, no, no. Field probably knows better than me. apologies. Apologies. <laughs> Esther House. He's that's he starts yeah. crying. So yeah. and Esther House and Percy. I always get the feeling that they were always the eggheads in the building. Or as George says, Esther House was found in a museum in what? He said something like he was Berlin broke. Control found him, and he was he was penniless, or he was homeless, or broke, or something he like that. He was working at a museum and penniless because he was a wanted man. Right, and he, he turned soon, so he must have been a spy. And he's clearly from a different country. He's clearly uh, German or something. Right. So he was probably just another egghead they picked up who knew stuff and was good at his job. And and Percy was probably the egghead during World War II. Who well, just knew stuff. Yeah. Never he, went into. But he needed his comeuppance. I mean, he, he I know he gets it when you see him when he's when he's walking he gets out, laid he's upset. off. Yeah. Well, they all get they all get reassigned. They're not going to get laid off, but they all get either reassigned and then booted out. Because this major they operation, all, this huge- They all messed it up. Witchcraft was a huge- uh, Blunder. Uh, yeah, exactly. But like, I wanted Alan Line to have come up as in terms of like Smiley slapping him or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, or like, he, and that's not his, that's not Smiley's way. And you kind of get that when he, like, he just saw Hayden. He's going to see Hayden. He's all like wet and distraught and just uh, walking Is out. Is he going to see Hayden? Yeah, that's the scene before he talks. We just talked about the line, like, so did you. When he goes to talk to Hayden one more time, and as he's walking in, the gate comes up, and Al Line's walking out, and he looks distraught. Oh, that wasn't George going to the office? No, that was him going to talk to Hayden, because oh, okay. Hayden was in that little park area. The cottage. Yeah, the yeah, side, like the, yeah. the prison kind of. It's my prison. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is that where Hayden's supposed to live for the rest of his life, in that little thing? No, he's going to be shipped back to, he's going to be shipped to Russia. Oh, right, okay. Because he's a mole, so he's going to go over there. Yeah. Right. They were just going to give it to him. Like, all right, all right you're Russian now. That's why the Russian guy said, I've been made. You're going to get a medal uh, and I'm going to be ex executed. In Russia. In Russia, yeah. So the Russian spy will get executed for botching his mission, but Hayden has given them so much information and the Americans yeah. that Hayden would be given a medal and just, oh, yeah, come on back. <laughs> well, <laughs> uncovering the spy, that's, but, I mean, I don't think he's getting any information. Who? Hayden. Uh Smiley, he uncovered the leak. So, oh, yeah, which yeah, is the yeah, biggest yeah. thing. Yeah. And he gets to shut down witchcraft, which was just an operation in order to get the Americans. But you know that those those two home. diplomats that were, were not, I don't know if they're diplomats, but whatever they were within they the were government. Yeah, yeah. That you know they're going away as well. You know they're going to be sent away because they let this happen. Or reassigned. Oh, yeah. They're, they're oh, yeah. definitely getting demoted at the very least. Right, right. And messing up the relationship they had with the Americans, which apparently at this point was not very good. In terms of sharing information. Yeah, that's a weird scene because show Alan Line leaving the paper with the American and then just walking away and 
it was it was really odd. Like it was just out of context because you never saw it again. You never talking to the Americans again. He just has that moment where he drops off information. Well, I think at that point you just that's there to show that okay, it's working. The Americans are now in. Right. Which you find out at the end was all the Russians wanted. The American they want the American secrets. They wanted all the American secrets, right? Now, as of 2016, they said that there's a the sequel is being written. Now, this is there's a there's a show from 1979 that had uh, Alec Guinness as George Smiley. It was a I think it was a miniseries in in England on BBC. Yeah. And then they did a. Do you know who played Carla? No, Patrick Stewart. Yes, nice. <laughs> uh, and, but so they, so they show Carla in that, but not in this one. Yeah, I like not showing Carla a yeah. little better. But they did Smiley's people after that miniseries because right. that was extremely popular in 1979. I, I told you off air, uh, I think the other day, that I wanted to actually try to see if I could watch this movie or watch this 79 version. But it's so it's no, you have to buy the deep disc and it's got both things or 60 bucks or 50 bucks. And I was just like, eh. I'm really surprised because the BBC has lately been pretty good about putting all their stuff out. Yeah. Because it was classically hard to find a lot of this BBC stuff. Right. But they've been really good lately, especially since BBC America kind of became popular. I wonder if it's on BritBox. Oh, maybe, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if it's for if it's I streaming forgot there. BritBox was a thing. It is a thing. <laughs> I don't I have the app, but I have not bought the app. I deleted the app because I didn't use it. But yeah, I, I have I had it wanted just to have it. Yeah. I sometimes will go on there and see what's on there. I don't I don't mind a good British show. They're pretty good. Oh no, I like them too. I love Foil's War. I don't know if you have I told you that. You have told me. I, I do want to watch that, but I haven't. Yeah. yeah. I know you a, say you like it. That's so good. I really like that show. It's only it's like they're like little movies, but they're good. Anyways. Uh so yeah, so they I they're going to or I guess assume they're still talking about doing Smiley's people uh as a as a sequel. But at this point, that's we're talking ten years from now. You know, we're ten years removed. Well, that's fine, because I think your cast would be pretty much different, right? I mean smiley's in that was one of my issues with the film at the end is you don't i would i wanted to see who his who his people on the top of the circus were he, who, he who definitely replaced everybody point, yeah i would imagine that peter would get that promotion but peter wasn't in there because he he walks past him and smiles exactly. as he's he, going in exactly like he yeah. still got his old job but i imagine that's also george's first day on back on the job but he's talking to people in there George? He, he sits he doesn't talk but he sits down right. and he motions like he's talk he's looking at someone like carrot continue he does you have to he, when you oh, go, i thought he just kind of looks around at the, he, he at looks the around but then he looks it looks like he's about to say you know let's let's start i, don't the know, I have to watch that again yeah but you still see some empty seats so he's definitely got to fill those seats sure but I, i'd like to see that and you could maybe get more boots on the ground type people more but people like ricky and what happened to ricky you just see him kind of waiting at this he's in paris in, in paris with the rain falling on him but you have to imagine that his his storyline should be that he can't escape this life. I don't want to be like you. I want a family. I don't want to end up like you folks. No offense. Well, but he the whole thing should be that he does end up. You can't escape that. Well, I don't think he will because he's going to find out that they killed the girl, the woman that he loved. George is going to – George should absolutely be telling him. I mean now that George got what he wanted out of Ricky, I think George owes it to Ricky to be Did like, he hey, know that dead. he was shot? Oh, because he gets Perdot that from – Yeah. Him the, uh, okay, yeah. When Perdoe is like, yeah, there was a girl brought into my room. But he doesn't know exactly that it was her. I think he assumes. Okay, okay. Because you get that, you get this flat. As soon as he says that, you get this very subtle, which is why Gary Oldman was nominated for the Oscar. You get this sure. very subtle, sullen look on his face. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. oh, that's Ricky's guy. Yeah. I, I really like the scene when George lets uh, Peter beat the crap out of Ricky, though. Oh, when, when he, when and, but he looks at the guy and like yeah, and goes, he's just like, hey, can you take care of that? All right, go ahead. He lets him get two punches <laughs> in before he says, stop him. George, yeah. do you know Ricky was working for us? Now? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a lot of little moments like that in the film. Uh, it's, it's a lot of those little moments from George that really, really, I think, do it for me. I really like watching what happens to a spy. You know, as much as I want to see the boots on the ground stuff, this is the spies after they get promoted, after they get that promotion. This is this is desk M. jobs. Yeah, spies. these are all the yeah. M's of the world kind of coming together. Yeah, and, they've and earned that. They've earned their, they've earned their stripes, I guess. And now they can get fat and sit behind the desk and just kind of move chess pieces around. Exactly. Which and is you, you learn that that's almost as dangerous as being, you know, boots on the ground, and that they're, you know, it's it's spies. These are spies that have grown to distrust anyone around them and so everyone's got an angle everyone even the people at the top of the circus even though they're not necessarily all the mole they're just accidentally working for the mole because they didn't realize it 
they all kind of have their own ideas and their own men that they won't tell each other who even their own sources are. And I thought that was very interesting. And that's in kind of the first flashback meeting with Control where George is sitting in. You get this feeling that, you know, Percy's not telling Hayden and not telling Control and not telling Smiley. That's the whole the whole world is based on secrets and, you know, you keeping them and how you holding on to the right secret that keeps you in power. It's all based on that. That's like that's a tough business to be in. Exactly. You, don't, you can't trust anybody. Exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. you and I are supposed to head up the spy division. And I can't trust you and you can't oh, trust absolutely me. Not because but we're you, supposed to run this division. I know. Yeah. And I could be I could be working with like five other people that they don't know each other and they don't you don't know them. And I'm tr- I'm getting intel on you so that I want your job. Like that kind of stuff. Like exactly. Yeah. It, or I'm getting intel on you because just in case you try to get intel on me so that if you try to pull something, I'll be like, well, I know about these. And, and I've got this safe. Well, yeah. I've got this. Right. Safe. So Gary Oldman was nominated for an Oscar for this movie. He went up against uh, Jean Desjardins for The Artist, Damien Bashir for A Better Life, George Clooney for The Descendants, and Brad Pitt for Moneyball. Do you remember who won? It wasn't Oldman, obviously. What was the first guy? Jean Dujardin. It was him, right? Yeah, he yeah. won for the artist. I I don't want to have to say when I read that. <laughs> when I read, well, I also won best picture. When I read that and best director, I was like, oh yeah, that's right. And then I'm like, wait a minute, I've not seen that movie since. I've not heard of that movie since it came out. No, I was just thinking the same thing. That's a forgotten film. Because really, a lot of the a lot of best picture winners become forgotten films because they're sometimes they're so independent or so not a wide release film that they just end up kind of getting hidden or not talked about or they're mm-hmm. so they're meant for a very specific audience like the artist is definitely not going to be good for a wide audience a wide audience doesn't care about the artist the oscars are tough the oscars are sometimes it's based on merit but a lot of times it's based on sentimentality and emotion and i mean i i, I don't want to say they're political i know that's the common phrase but it, and i don't mean it's they're political in terms of like republican democrat they're political in terms of just the political capital within the hollywood you know infrastructure oh for sure so it's very difficult to really kind of uh, that i i back when i was younger i used to do the oscar pools i used to be like oh i can't i gotta watch all the oscar movies i can't this person i used to always like oh this person's the best act but as you grow up i hope for some people hmm. as you get older and mature you just you just realize it, it i remember as a kid listening to people going oh it's just an honor to be nominated and i'd be like i want to win <laughs> but now you're like it, 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 it just is to get honor, noticed yeah. it is really that's really the honor winning is great and it opens up doors for you yes sometimes it doesn't because when's the last time you saw jean de jardin but it's really just i want to say the luck of the draw because olden could have won for this but he won for the darkest hour because he portrayed a, a, a major figure mm-hmm. he he changed his appearance and he was the movie. The whole movie was him. Like that's why he won. I also think he was also nominated before, and it's he's, he's no. This is the only no. This is his only nomination. This well, is only he, his two nominations. This in the darkest hour. Right. Yeah. He, that's what I mean. He's been nominated before. And oh he's been, right. And right. he's been around for a while. Right. He's made a lot of friends at that point. Like Tom Hanks was nominated for Philadelphia, and he won. He was nominated for Forrest Gump, and he won. Right. And then he was nominated for Apollo thirteen, and he didn't win. But I'm going to tell you right now. He should have won for Apollo 13 because he is awesome in that movie. But that's fine. He got two, so he's not going to get three. And his win for Philadelphia, it's really good. But that Philadelphia win is more about the movie than it is about Tom Hanks. He's a great performance. It's about who he plays. Right. Absolutely. Right. And that's fine. And I'm not poo-pooing that. And I'm not, you know, crapping all over that. That I, I understand it. I understand the game and I understand the, the, the whole thing. I, I'm just saying that you can't really take it, you know, as – Hard and true, black and white, best performance, any of that stuff. You have to understand like what goes on behind the scenes. Because we talk about all the time about how movies that are nominated or actors are nominated. We're like, no, he shouldn't have won. This person has a great performance like that thing. Like I watch Moneyball all the time. And Brad Pitt was nominated for Moneyball. He is awesome in Moneyball. Like Moneyball is a great film. You know, okay, he didn't win, but he is still fantastic in that movie. Well, that's like you said, nominating, being nominated is like winning. Yeah. And then, like you said, the rest of it's political. Yep. Yep. But nominees deserve to be nominated. Most of the time. Sure. And the winner is the one that kind of has the most backing or, or the agent yeah. really pushes after I, that. But I mean, if I got nominated, I'd be so happy because that those gift baskets are worth like 10, <laughs> well, you just 10 to $100,000. You don't have to get nominated. You could just go on somebody's arm. So maybe if Elise gets nominated, you can go and get that gift, ba- gift basket. Oh, no. The gift ba- the Oh, for just the winners? The, just nominees, the nominees get more. Oh, okay. Oh, well. I mean, if you're there, you get all the the free bars and the restaurants. What's wrong with that? Which is uh, that's awesome fine too. too. Yeah. 
Well, let's get off the Oscars. So <laughs> I know we kind of talked about it already, but I guess let's maybe reiterate why we think this is forgotten. Okay. Well, I put it on the list, so oh, I guess go I'll for go it. first. Um, it's not really a there's not it's not really a format here. I'm just well, no, I know, but I, I know that you said you didn't think it was forgotten. Um, well, we I mean, talking, I, I, like I think for ago. general audiences, maybe people just didn't ever go, never want to have any interest in seeing it in terms of it being forgotten. In terms of I saw it, I never want, talked about it again. I don't I don't know. I think go ahead. But I don't I don't know. So I think that pretty much that's it. It's it's a movie that stars older actors. You're not going to get that wide audience going to watch, you know, the newest James Bond. There's no explosions. There's gunplay, but it's it's not really a like a shootout. It's an adult it's just, film. It, it's a it's an adult film. It's a slow burn. It's reminiscent of seventies films. It's a film you really have to pay attention to. So you're not going to see this on TV very often on like FX or anything because it's not something you just put on. And I think a lot of those kind of movies that you, I mean, some of those movies are great that you can just put on and have in the background and watch, you know, scenes of tons of movies like that. So my favorite movies are like that. But this one, you absolutely have to sit down and you're watching it for the two hours it's on. Uh, and I think that's unfortunate that it wasn't really given a chance after theaters to try to win people over because the acting is fantastic. The storyline's fantastic. And the spy stuff is really cool because it's everything they're doing is dangerous, but it's not because of like fights and stuff like that. It's what they say or what they do or who they meet. And it's, the environment around them anyone can get killed by anybody at any time and sure if you just listen to the dialogue and understand that world you know that and i think it's filmed incredibly and it's got some amazing amazing performances by pretty much every actor in here does an amazing job with their performance i also think released in the christmas time slot and it's not a huge lord of the rings mission impossible type film it's right. a movie designed to get oscar nods uh, I think it does get lost in the shuffle. You know, I think that it, unless it's on Christmas, like War Horse was Christmas. So I just kind of trying to compare it with a movie that's a little bit more adult like it is. It, it's it kind of it comes out before Christmas. And then what's all the other movies come out? It just kind of gets pushed back. Yeah. I mean, those are it. It went up a lot. A lot of good movies. The movies you I listed are all fantastic. Um, and like you said, they're all a lot of them are adult movies. Yeah, no, you, that's what you get towards the end of the season in a normal time, not during the pandemic time. But that's what you get during a season is you get all you not only get all the big releases for the holiday, but you get all the movies that people are trying to get out there for Oscar season right. just to get under the gun. And so it comes out limited in, in December and then January it comes out wide. But the January audience is not as heavy as it is before. Yeah, the they're holiday. not there. Yeah. yeah. So. They spent uh, their money on right. the other ones. Right. I think I saw it when it came out wide. Yeah. I didn't. I think I think you got to see it when it was limited because I think we had it. I've seen this. in day. the. I saw this in the theater. Right. Because I definitely saw this with Elise. Yeah. I saw this in the theater. But she liked this movie and I was surprised because this is yeah. usually a movie that she would like. But Wow. Interesting. I would say because I know we always say this too. This is the type of movie that you. I would suggest to somebody who wants to be a writer. Um, somebody who I know likes spy movies or spy genres, but somebody who wants to, uh, who's into filmmaking, is into writing, or maybe even storytelling, this would be a movie I would show them. I would tell them to go watch 70s films, but this would be one of the movies I'd add to that. You know what's funny? I have a note here that, you know, I love writing films and I, 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 I dabble with writing as well. <laughs> I, I dabble? <laughs> I dabble as well. Well, I know you write like every day. Thanks, I'm, man. Like I'll write once in a while. But every morning. I would be so scared to write this 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 script because I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could write a script like this. It's you know what it is. I, I but to to be fair, they do have a source material, so you do have the book to go off of, right? In terms of it's so internal, yes, it's it yeah. so I wouldn't know how to write it. I, I will I the, just the book keep helps. writing notes of he has this look on his face. It's so like you have to depend. You really have to write the script. Hoping and knowing that you're going to have great actors that can really understand what they need to be doing. Oh, I mean, that's writing the script. Well, that's two different things. That's two different problems. Writing the script is you've got the source. You having a writing partner is probably very helpful. Even if you're somebody who just writes but alone, having somebody to be a sounding board is very helpful. Yeah. You know, using the book as basically your Bible and using it as your outline. You probably want to outline the stuff in the book and then figure out what figure out what theme you're trying to tell, what story you want to tell, what you want to focus on. So if you're just going to focus on Smiley and his arc and then add the other arcs in there the ricky tar arc and stuff like that yeah, yeah. i think that would work um 
but from scratch is probably w- tougher than to do that, than to adapt the book. But the other, the other thing that you're saying in terms of that's the director's job in terms of making sure that they understand that right. script. I get you there. No, but that's I'm, like yeah. selling the script, like just handing it to somebody, read this. What do you think? Yeah. It's, so much of that is, is what you get visually by watching the actor's performance. Mm-hmm. And you know, what I learned when I was um, taking screenwriting classes, you want to do as little of those notes as possible. Sure. Because the actor is not going to want to be told what to do in the script. Some actors, you know, do though. Some actors oh, of need course. it. Yeah. yeah. Some, some actors, some like, actors well, need it. And God. there's that there's that dance between director and actor where you're trying to figure out the relationship, what they need, what they don't need, in terms of your notes. And I would never give actors line reads. You know that. Right. But I do. I don't think it hurts to sit down and have conversations about the characters. Oh, just for sure. conversations, yeah. not. You know, this is what you think, and what do you think? Oh, I like that, like that kind of. But again, thing. that's a director actor thing. Yeah. And then if you do it at the ba- the most base level, I think that's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would really be interested in reading. I mean, not just a novel, although I'm interested in that. I I would want to read the script. Yeah. Because I would want to know how the hell they write something like this. Because again, I can't even try to picture these scenes, some of these yeah. scenes in my head. It's it's listen. It's if you're do if that's your main job, it's it's probably a tough undertaking, but. That's your main job. So that's all you're doing. So yeah, right. I hear you. You're thinking like like you right now. I gotta record this. I gotta do this episode. I gotta do this commercial. How am I gonna have time to research this movie to write this? No, you're thinking in that terms. In terms of like, all I do is write. It's eight hours a day, every day, every five days a week. That's their job. They yeah, probably a giant rewriting, whiteboard. And rewriting yeah, yeah, that's all. It is. Writing, writing and such. But they, like you said, a sounding board. Hey, read this. I so, did this. Something things. like that, though. Something like this. I think you would probably, you could also go like scene by scene, like, oh, I really like this scene. I'm just going to write it. I know we're going to use it. I don't know where it's going to be, but I'm just going to write the scene. Sometimes they just write scenes out and then they yeah. piece them together. That would be easy for some of these scenes, like the uh, when Mark Strong and Oldman are talking, when Ricky Tarr and Oldman are talking. Those are definitely scenes where you right. kind of just write it. You write the op- you write the scene where he gets shot. In the beginning, yep. you might not necessarily know that's the beginning, but you write that scene because you're like, I, I kind of envision how this scene is. Although in the book, this scene takes place in Czechoslovakia. In the movie, it takes place in Hungary because oh, yeah. they had the 20% tax credits. That's why they did it in Hungary. Yeah, tax credits. <laughs> but you know, if you know what that scene in and of itself is going to be, mm-hmm. you can just write it. And then, yeah. okay, I we have our five pages of the when he gets shot. We'll figure out where we're going to put it in later. Yeah. So, yeah. You can even have the control scenes that you can write separately, you know what I mean? Within the book. And yeah. yeah. So I, I, I understand it, it is an undertaking, but I think it's doable. I can do it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I think we both like this movie quite a bit. Recommend it. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Where, where can they find us? They can find us at forgotten cinema podcast.com or forgotten entertainment.com. As we are part of the forgotten entertainment family. You can also find us wherever podcasts are available. I said it at the beginning and it's still true now. Uh, you can also find us on the social medias at Forgotten Cinema or Forgotten Cinema Pod, depending on where you go. We post every weekday and we have uh, fun commercials every Thursday you can check out for our upcoming episodes. And uh, that's uh, that's what I got. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're coming back next week. We're doing the 1988 film Shoot to Kill, which is what I put on the list. And I remember really liking this movie. But the fact that I now found out that it's royalty free has scared me from liking this movie. I'm, I'm a little, <laughs> but it was starred Tom Berenger, Kirstie Alley and Sidney Poitier. So I like this movie quite a bit, but I haven't seen it probably in 20 years. So I'm a little nervous now. But hopefully we don't have a Palmetto situation going on. Sidney Poitier is in it. But I love Sidney Woody Poitier. Harrelson was in the other movie and it was. Like- <laughs> yeah, but I, but I, I love Sidney Poitier. So exactly. I, I, I think that I'm really positive that you know, that I like this movie. <laughs> and I'm really hoping. Uh, Butler, once again, this is not the movie I, I thought no, it was. No, 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 no. <laughs> I just because of the fact that I found out it's royalty free. I'm just like, what happened? Why is it? Why does nobody want this movie? <laughs> 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 what have I done? What have I done? All right. I'm single handedly derailing the Forgotten Cinema Podcast by choosing these weird <laughs> films. <laughs> See you next week. I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And this has been Forgotten Cinema.